Wow, I'm sorry, guys. I've been speaking. I didn't realize I was mute. I was on mute. I had muted myself. So sorry. I get it now. Okay, this is Life Sciences Grade 11. My name is Tutuzile Kupeka. Unkarabetsi will be back after the study break. We are going on a study break from the 8th to the 16th. So we will see you guys from the 17th onwards. From Monday to the 16th, there will be no class. Please remember that. Plus, stay tuned and sign up for the newsletters so you can keep getting more announcements and updates. We are continuing with June 2016 today. First question here is, we need to write, give correct biological terms. Keyword being biological term. So I need you to pay attention to that biological term. So you don't just write any common names that you know, you need to give the correct biological terms. For 1.2.1, this is a disease in which the hormonal control of glucose is defective because of a deficiency of insulin. So this here affects the endocrine system. Ne? Remember that the endocrine system, this here, this is a disease that affects that is part of an endocrine system. It is mainly regulated by the pancreas. So I'm trying to give you hints here. It's regulated by the pancreas. There are islets of lung and hands whereby you have alpha cells and beta cells. So this here is a deficiency in the beta cells because the beta cells are the ones that secrete insulin insulin so this has to do with high levels of blood sugar in your in your system when your body cannot control or cannot bring down the high levels of glucose or sugar in your system because what there would be a deficiency of insulin what is that disease called yes it is diabetes the full name would be what? Who remembers the full name? Diabetes mellitus. That is the full name of this disease. But honestly, I would give you the one mark even if you had said diabetes. But just to be safe, learn the full, full name, eh? diabetes mellitus. Question 1.2.2. A six carbon molecule that is broken down during cellular respiration to provide energy in a living cell. What is the six carbon molecule? So here you would need to understand the structure of this molecule. What is the six carbon molecule? Which is broken down during cellular respiration to provide energy in a living cell. Okay, if it's silent, I'm assuming it's cause you do not know. It is glucose. Glucose is that it's, it has six carbons in its structure, right? You'll remember that. And another hint is that it is involved. You find glucose in the process of cellular respiration where it is broken down to provide energy in a living cell. So we get the energy from the glucose. 1.2.3, a type of reproduction that does, not, that does not involve the fusion of male and female gametes. Thank you, little Nolo. It's asexual reproduction, whereby there is no. Uh, okay, little Nolo, it's this. That's good. Thank you for that. This one here, asexual reproduction, it occurs without a fusion of male and female. So it could be a type where there's binary fusion, where the cell, the cell just splits into half, or when there are spores involved, but there is no sexual process involved here so you do not need a male and female for this to occur 1.2.4 
a microorganism used in the manufacturing of beer and bread. What microorganism is that? You need it in the manufacturing of beer and bread. Hey. <laughs> it's easy. You need yeast when you manufacture bread and beer. So this one here, even if you did not understand biology, you'd know that when we make beer, we need the, the yeast there to ferment. It's used for the fermentation process, right? Even for bread, when you break, when you bake, bake your bread, even when you bake, what's this? Dumplings, ne? When you make dumplings, you need to put yeast in there. Then it ferments. And that fermentation process would allow it then to, to, to rise. So if, you, if you're baking your bread and you don't put yeast, then it won't, it won't rise. It won't, it won't expand. What's the correct word? How do I phrase that? But you understand most, if you wanna attempt to make dumplings, let's say dumplings or even bread, and you don't put yeast, it won't come out proper. It would be very, very hard. You won't even be able to chew on it. And beer won't ferment. So there won't be any alcohol present in that, in that mixture, in that substance. And then 1.2.5, the flap-like structure which prevents food from entering the trachea. So you need to understand that structure there of the respiratory system and the digestive system there, they are almost interlinked. Flap-like prevents food from entering the trachea because it's so close. Have you seen that structure when you're doing the digestive system and then the respiratory system, you see they are so close to each other. The esophagus is so, so close to the trachea over there. But how is it that your body maintains? It doesn't get confused. You wouldn't be trying to eat and then your food is suddenly in the respiratory canal. If you are eating, it would go through the alimentary canal, right? But if you are breathing, then it has its own canal. How is it? How is that? How does that happen? The structures are set. It's the epiglottis. Epiglottis. That is that flap-like structure. And then 1.2.6. The process by which small quantities of a microorganism or toxin is injected into the body to produce antibodies. We did this yesterday. We explained this process yesterday. Remember when we were discussing malaria? Yeah, we covered it with malaria. What is this process over here by which small quantities of a microorganism or toxin is injected into the body to produce antibodies? Guys, is Lishona the only one in class today? What's going on, everybody? JJ, are you not speaking to me today? Kuzwayo, Kumzil, EDP. There's no way JJ is the uh, Lishona is the only one. Talk to us, please, guys. We've got vaccination. We discussed this yesterday. You remember we were explaining that whole process of what of what is it, Gonja? Immunity. We're, for, we're discussing the process of immunity when we're explaining how malaria affects mostly people who are maybe travelers, business travelers, or tourists because they would get that disease from an area where people who reside in that area have had acquired immunity to that disease or that infection or whatever it is because they may have been infected once and then produced antibodies so that the next time infection occurred they were now resistant to that that is the same process used in vaccination vaccination is whereby we give anyone who's getting the vaccine just portions of that virus or that infection 
so that the body can produce antibodies to fight that off. Then should it, should it happen that you encounter that same infection again, your body is ready to fight it off because the antibodies are already there. So that is the process of vaccination. Thanks, Kuzwayo, and welcome back. I'm glad that you're speaking to us now. And then number seven, a group of sporangia on the pinna of a fan plant. A group of sporangia on the pinna of a fan plant. That is a sorus. Remember that? Sorus. So you need to go learn the structures of these plants, ne? the different groups of these plants. 1.2.8, an evolutionary trend in the animal kingdom towards centralization of neural and sensory organs in the anterior region of the body. We discussed this again, it was, it's not yesterday, it was probably Tuesday, I think it was Tuesday when we were discussing this one here, where the body, it's an evolutionary trend as you can see, but humans have that same structure even your, all your animals that you can think of. They have a centralized neural and sensory organs in the anterior region of the body. So they're in the head area or your brain. That's your head area where that's where they are centralized. Yes, Lithonola, it's civilization. Thank you. Then number nine, a group of plants that have seeds enclosed in an ovary. This we did yesterday and Monday and Tuesday, actually. A group of plants that have seeds enclosed in an ovary. If you haven't noticed by now, this is like a very common question. It is asked in different ways. If it's not asked for one word answers, it is asked in the match columns A or B or in the multiple choice. But it is definitely a very, very popular question. So you need to understand which plants have seeds enclosed in ovaries which ones don't. So go learn the whole structures of plants and their different groups. That is definitely not it. This is for number 10, actually. I'm sorry, guys, that is number 10. I can see the mistake there. This here is an answer for number 10. Let me try and rectify that. So give me the answer for number nine. I don't know how we missed that. It's number 10 here. Yes, guys, those are angel spams. Angel spams have their seeds in the ovaries. And then which ones don't have seeds enclosed? Which ones don't have seeds enclosed? The opposite, direct opposite of an angel sperm would be what? Gymnosperms, yes, thank you. The opposite of that, whereby their seeds are not enclosed in a protective capsule or layer are gymnosperms. But angel sperms are also called flowering plants or seed plants because they've got seeds enclosed in those ovaries or cells. So, yep, thank you. I'm sorry about that mistake, Nick, guys. Let me write number nine. It's angel spams. Okay, you got the catch the drift. Next question, 1.1.9. An investigation was carried out to test the effectiveness of four antifungal treatments on preventing the growth of yeast. The results are shown in the diagram below. So you've got your dish here, your petri dish or your agar plate. Then you've got fungi clear, you've got mycocide, you've got mycopen, and you've got fungi sen. Whenever you see this, this dotted uh, area, which is black, it means there's yeast growth there. But if it's white, it means there's no yeast growth. And then this one here in a circle would be the antifungal treatment. So these ones here are the treatments, but here you're given the exact, exact names of those particular treatments. You see, you have four different treatments over there and you put them in different places in the agar plate there so that you can see. So there's agar, all, there's east here, all around here. This is east, this is east. So when you put this antifungal treatment there, 
you put antifungal treatment over there. You can see which one is most effective. Which one of the following conclusions can be made from the results? A, all the antifungal treatments are equally effective. B, all the antifungal treatments are ineffective. C, mycoside is most effective and fungicin is least effective. Let's go see. Mycoside is more, most effective and fungicin is least effective. Or D, fungicin is most effective and mycoside is least effective. Yes, thank you, JJ, Lishonol, and Pumzile. The answer is C. Mycoside, as you can see, when mycoside is placed, it clears up the yeast all around. It clears it up, you see? There's no yeast here. There's no yeast growth where it is. But with fungicide, there's absolutely no change that it occurred. Only about small circle there. There's it's little to zero change. So C is the correct one. So if you were to choose a specific antifungal treatment to use, then you would definitely go for mycocyte because you can see it is very effective in treating and in treating fungal growth or yeast growth. Next question, it is match column A and B. Remember with this one, you write the number 1.3.1 1 and then you write A only or B only or both A and B. Question 1.3.1, a division of plants with a vascular system, seeds, and no flowers. There's a vascular system. There are seeds, but there are no flowers. We just did this as well, guys. Is it gymnosperms or angiosperms? Remember, even yesterday, we said this other one would have cones instead of flowers. Others, the one, the one other here, is a flowering plant, so it has flowers. The other one is, it bears no flowers, so it would be cones mostly. So it is A only, gymnospermai. Thank you. And when Apumzile, you, you got four marks for that, for answering that way. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you answer that way in class. And then question 1.3.2, which one of these two is Triploblastic, triploblastic, triploblastic or triploblastic. But the tri here is for three, it means three, three layered. Which one has three layers here? Ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. Which one of these two? I wanted to show you pictures. I don't know if we will. I want I would show you pictures, but just try after the class and Google them now. If you finish, I'll be able to show you. But these, both of them are triploblastic. They have three layers, both A and B. Thank you, JJ got that correct. Thanks, JJ. 1.3.3, the type of symbiotic relationship displayed by E. coli living in the human intestine. What is that type of symbiotic relationship? Which type of symbiotic relationship do we learn from E. coli and the, the E. coli that lives in the human intestines? So you first need to know the differences between the two. Ne? With the first one, it's if only one is benefiting and the other is not benefiting and is also not harmed. That is commensalism. So here, one would benefit. The other one it just wouldn't be bothered, actually. They wouldn't be benefiting and they also wouldn't be harmed. And mutualism is if both are benefiting. So with this one, yes, you are correct, Kuzwayo. It is B, it is mutualism. We are both 
both benefiting. You need the E. coli there in your intestines to help in the digestion there before the food is excreted as waste. Then that's when the human needs it, right? And the E. coli is benefiting because it's getting shelter and food in that way as well. And then 1.3.4, what is a fluid-filled body cavity lined by mesoderm? Fluid-filled body cavity lined by mesoderm. Okay, I'm assuming you don't know. It would be okay. JJ answered just in time. And I think Kuzwa too, is it? JJ. It is the coulomb. Coulomb is that fluid filled body cavity lined by mesoderm. 1.3.5. Some are autotrophic whilst others are heterotrophic. Uh, this one is, should be easy. We discuss this together once again. Autotrophic is if you convert things that are non-organic and you make them into food. And then heterotrophic Heterotrophic is when you can't manufacture your own food. Why are you excluding A, guys? <laughs> I'm so not sure. Remember when we first discussed this together? Yeah, JJ is like, wait, B. <laughs> guys, we discussed this. And when we discussed this, we were discussing bacteria particularly. We're discussing the autotrophic bacteria, which was converting light energy into food, organic food, remember? But we also learned that bacteria, there are other types of bacteria which can't make, make their own food. So they would depend on the environment or plants or other sources of food for them to eat. And protists are also like that. There are other protists which can make their own food and others depend on food. So it is both A and B. B. That is why I'm not sure why you you did it. You completely disregarded A when it is the one we actually discussed together in class. But yep, I hope you have learned the mistake then and taken note of it. One point three point six. This one trans the transports and products of digested food from the intestine to the liver. It transport the end products of digested food from the intestines to the liver. So this year, because now it's coming from the intestines, guys, to the liver. Usually, if, if, it's, if it's not needed by the body coming from the intestines, where would it go? It would go straight for excretion because it would be waste. But because this one is coming from the intestines to the liver, it means it carries nutrient rich substances that is useful for the body. So we need, we look, need to choose a vein here that transports nutrient rich food to the parts of the body. But in this one, it is transporting it to the liver. Okay, I see you are quiet, so I think you are not sure. It is the hepa hepatic portal vein. That hepatic portal system 
is named like that because it connects capillaries of the intestines and other digestive organs to modified capillaries of the liver. So that is why it's called like that. When intestinal blood is nutrient rich, ne? probably after a meal, so a few hours after a meal, that intestinal blood would be nutrient rich. This type of vein then will be able to take these available nutrients before blood is distributed to the rest of the body. So it would take the nutrient rich blood, this vein over here. I hope you, you are clear with that and you are understanding that part. So that's why it is option A. 1.3.7, root-like structures in moss plants. Okay, whilst I'm waiting for you to answer that one, I wanna explain this, the hepatic vein. What is the difference? You see that the, the names are similar. The only difference is that portal, me. The hepatic vein would then be transporting blood from the liver to the inferior vena cover. So you see the correlation there? The hepatic portal vein would transport the blood from the intestine to the liver. And once it's in the liver, the hepatic vein would then take that blood from the liver to the inferior vena cover. Understood? And then root-like structures in most plants. B only. Thank you, Lishonolo. It is B only. It is the rhizoids. Next question here, question 1.4. Study the diagram that illustrates bubbles of gas being released during an investigation and answer the questions that follow. So what is this investigation over here? You've got your beaker. Inside your beaker, there's water containing sodium bicarbonate. This water here, the sodium bicarbonate. Then there's your funnel. Funnel over here, and there's the olo Elodia plant in the funnel. Inside the funnel, there's the Elodia plant. Then we've got what's here? The test tube faced, uh, faced upside test down. Your, your test tube is faced upside down. There are gas bubbles inside the test tube. At the very top there, there would be gas. That's the empty space. Then there's light shining here, light on this. It means this is conducted in an area where there is light. Then 1.4.1, name the process that is being investigated in this experiment. It is photosynthesis. I don't know why it's at that top there. Thank you, Lichonolo. This process is photosynthesis. You've got your plant there. You've got your light. There's gas. There's water. All those, the funnel over there. You've got all your things that you need. Before we continue. Okay, no, it's asked actually in the next question. 1.4.2. Identify the gas that accumulates in the test tube. We have deduced that it is photosynthesis. So what gas is, will then form here? What gas would be collected at the, the gas there in the, in the test tube? That gas would be oxygen because during the process of photosynthesis, oxygen is released. Oxygen is released, but where, where is it coming from? Where is this oxygen coming from? What is used here to, to, to extract this oxygen? What compound is used here? Where is this, where did it suddenly come from? I mean, when you start this, there's no oxygen. Suddenly there's oxygen accumulating. Where is it coming from? Do you know where it's coming from?
Yeah, thank you, Ena Lishonolo from that sodium bicarbonate. 1.4.3, describe the procedure used to test for the gas referred to in question 1.4.2. How would you, what is the procedure used to test for this gas over here? This is the procedure. You would insert a glowing splinter into the test tube. If the splinter catches light, it indicates presence of oxygen. So that's how they would test it afterwards here, to test for this gas, to test if it really is oxygen that is accumulated, right? Remember when something would, if it catches light, for it to catch light, you would need oxygen. So if it doesn't catch light, it would mean there is no oxygen accumulated over here. And then question 1.4.4, explain why sodium bicarbonate was added to the water in this investigation. Why, why was it added? Lishonolo answered briefly that it increases the supply of carbon dioxide that is needed for photosynthesis because the plant would need the carbon dioxide, right? So you need the carbon dioxide, so you put in sodium bicarbonate. Then the plant would take in this carbon dioxide. Then during the process of photosynthesis, the plant would then release oxygen. You see? So some sodium bicarbonate, there is carbon here, right? So there is, you release, it would release CO2, increasing the supply of CO2 in this experiment taken in by the plant, which will then allow it to release more oxygen. And then 1.4.5, explain how a control can be set up for this experiment. So you can think of different ways. You know, remember when you set up a control, this is when you are testing if your theory is true about this process of photosynthesis. So you can eliminate any one of the inputs required for photosynthesis. So the one control would be, you could remove the light because you need light for photosynthesis to take place, right? You could remove light and control it in a different place. So that's when you would be testing the, the light part of this experiment. Maybe another way would be, I don't know, it wouldn't be as effective. Probably if you, you, if you remove the sodium bicarbonate, ne? even though probably the plant would be able to produce a certain amount of oxygen. So that wouldn't be able to actually fully, fully control this experiment because the plant might already have certain portions of, of carbon dioxide, which will be released to oxygen. So that wouldn't be complete. So the most effective way to test this is to put this in the dark. So remove this light element, set it up exactly as it is, but put it in the dark and see what happens over there. Okay, that is that one part. I'm gonna move on to sharing the, the other slides ne? for today. Yeah, we don't have time, I can't, okay. How much time do we have? I think 10 minutes. Ne? So I'll cover whatever we'll be able to cover. I've shown you that answer already, so we'll move on. With, we read this extract below. Aerobic and anaerobic respiration are used to supply energy during exercise. During certain types of exercise, for example, athletic events such as 100 meter, 200 meter, 1,500 meters, and 3,000 meters, the muscles are unable to obtain sufficient oxygen for the removal of large quantities of lactic acid from their cells. When sprinting, an athlete, an athlete cannot possibly inhale more than the fraction of the oxygen required, and the body goes into oxygen debt. Oxygen debt can be defined as the extra oxygen needed to normalize the process after strainers exercise. This debt can only be repaid by rapid breathing after the sprint ends. 
So you need rapid breathing after the screen ends. Number one, 2.2.1. 2 .2 Name two end products of aerobic respiration in muscle cells. Aerobic respiration, it would be water and carbon dioxide. Those ones would be produced as end products during aerobic respiration in muscle cells. Water could probably be visible through the, the what's the sweat you'd release next. Then a carbon dioxide would be the air you breathe out when you exhale. And then 2.2.2, which athletic event relies the most on anaerobic respiration? Which one over here? I'm just gonna move through quickly because you are, you, it would take time. It is the 100 meters race. That is the one that would re require the, rely the most on the anaerobic respiration. And then explain your answer to question 2.2.2. .2. Due to the sudden burst of activity, the body needs to quickly supply energy. You see, because it's a sudden burst, it's like 100 meters. For the other ones, it's, it's a longer race. The body is getting more time to get used to what the new process that's happening here. So for this 100 meters one, it would need to quickly get that boost of energy through an aerobic respiration. 2.2.4, which two athletic events would give rise to a high oxygen debt? Which one would give rise to a high oxygen debt? It would be the 100 meter and 200 meter. And I know it might be confusing, especially because you think these longer ones would be the ones that would take, would need, would require, would have high oxygen depth. But because these ones take longer, I mean, your body gets time to adjust and you're not moving as fast as you would move in 100 meters or 200 meters. There's absolutely no way you'd run at the same speed when you're running a 100 meters race as when you are running at 3,000 meters, you would die. If you were to use that speed of 100 meters in a 3,000 meters, you wouldn't even be able to finish your race. But this one here, the longer ones, you need to pace yourself well. You plan your, 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 your journey. That's why people don't just enter into marathons. They actually take months and months preparing. So their bodies get used to this and they adjust accordingly. So it's not just a sudden burst of activity that is happening and for a very long period of time. No, just for a short period of time whereby you are sprinting, then that's 100 meters. But for the other ones, you take time, you pace yourself. Ne? Uh, okay, then next one here is question 2.2.5. This will be the last ones we do, the 2.5 and 2.6. Describe what happens to the energized hydrogen atoms released during aerobic respiration. Energized hydrogen atoms will combine with a core enzyme. During oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondrion, the hydrogen atom is transferred from one core enzyme to the next. And at every transfer, there is a release of energy which is trapped as ATP. So that is what happens. Question six. Tabulate two differences between aerobic and anaerobic respiration. So these are the differences, we are tabulating them. Aerobic requires oxygen, the most obvious ones. You require oxygen, anaerobic, it's independent of oxygen. You can, they can take place without oxygen. And then the second part is it takes place in the cytosol and mitochondria, the aerobic respiration but anaerobic takes place in the cytosol only. Aerobic, the byproducts are carbon dioxide and water with aerobic respiration. You can even do the chemical, the, 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 the formula, the equation there, and you'll see the byproducts is dependent on the, on the inputs. Then anaerobic, the byproducts are carbon dioxide and ethanol in plants. So in plants, it would produce ethanol, but in animals, it would produce lactic acid. Aerobic respiration, it releases large amounts of energy, but anaerobic respiration releases little energy. So those are the differences. Remember what I said to you yesterday, even here, 
it's five marks, but they ask you to different to, to, to tabulate only two differences. So it would be one mark, one mark for the first two here, one mark, one mark for the first two. Then the other fifth mark will come from you drawing the table and labeling accordingly. So please, please, please. And also when you draw, you need to tell you, you are comparing, right? You are writing the differences. So when you write on your left requires oxygen, the one you write under N aerobic should correspond, should be a comparison with what happens on the other side. So you can't be writing requires oxygen. And then on this right side, you say little energy released. No, it needs to correlate. It needs to make sense. It needs to flow. You understood, right guys? Yeah, I think before we, we get cut off, uh, that is it from me today because we don't have any much more time. If you need any more of this information or these slides, go to YouTube guys or drop us an email, Unkara Beji or myself, and then we will assist you. Remember the study break. I'm trying to give you my email address here. We are going on a study break. Don't forget that now. So any questions before we have to go? That is my email address. If you have any questions or need any further explanations about the work we've been doing this week. Any, any, anything else you need? Questions, comments, anything? Okay, guys, if there's nothing, then I will, <laughs> I don't know if we'll ever meet again, but it was very nice working with you. Thank you for welcoming me so lovely. Yeah, I enjoyed my time with you. Thank you so, so much. Enjoy your weekend. Take care of yourselves. Wash your hands. Uh, wear your masks. And yeah, take care of yourselves. I always tell my learners, if it's something you can control, do your best to control it. Everything else, accept it. Find ways to work around it. So even the situation we are faced with now, whatever you can't control, leave it. If you can control it, do your best to keep it under your control. Ne? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.